Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and today in this video series, A Chat with Authors, we're going to talk with Matt Richter about his book, A Leadership Story. A new the leadership, leadership Story. Pardon? It's The Leadership Story. There's oh, that's only right. one. It is The <laughs> Leadership Story, a new model of leadership published way back in 2016, but we're going to revive it here in this. But before we launch into discussing this book, Matt, would you please introduce yourself to our audience and provide us a little bit about you and your background that relate to leadership? Sure. So I'm Matt. I've been with the Tiagi Group, uh, which is a company with a guy named Tiagi, uh, me, his son, his wife. It's a family enterprise, and we do training. We design it. We facilitate it. We teach others to do it. Uh, and so we focus on everything and all things related to the training side of learning and development. What's that have to do with leadership? Yes. Well, I have been hired to do leadership development for, well, for the last 20 years. And, well, I'm pretty sure there is some user error to that. I'm pretty confident that whether you hired me or anyone else, most of the leadership development out there is bulldooky, useless, a waste of time, a waste of money, a waste of effort. There are several resources and, and research out there to validate my view. Um, I didn't do it. Other people did it. Um, so I, I became interested in why is that so and married that to my passion, uh, which is political history. So I've my entire life uh, at least adult life, been fascinated by politics and, and history and specifically presidential history in the U.S. as well as in other countries and um, uh, have been an amateur historian. And so I married those two, two thoughts and came up with this notion of what leadership really is. Of course, there's no research to validate my view any more than there's anyone else's. Well, thank you for all of that. Now, uh, I bought the book. I, I went and checked on Amazon to see when I bought the book, but I bought the book back in March of 2018. So it had been a while since I had read it. And so I reviewed it. Again. You and the other six people. Yeah, the, I, I think I have their names someplace. Well, um, one was my mom. <laughs> but uh, so I went and reviewed the book uh, yesterday and this morning in preparation for this. But uh, so... Tell us, who is this book for and what was your motivation for writing it? It was actually for me because I couldn't find any book out there that, that had the constructivist views that I have, um, meaning that uh, leadership is really a, a social construct. It's this, this notion that it's, it's, it's something we, we make up. It, it's a, a story, a narrative. Uh, about the people around us. And, and no one had talked about it that way. Um, there are lots of other concepts that have been um, discussed from a constructivist view, but, but I hadn't found leadership to do so. Um, so I wrote the book for me and I kind of knew there wouldn't be too many people, uh, in, uh, at least in the US that would be interested in that perspective because in the US we're, we're kind of pretty hero oriented about our views on leadership that, you know, there, there's someone that comes in on the, the white horse and the white hat to kill all the bad guys. And we won't get into the, the racial overtones of that, but there are certainly, uh, uh, there's certainly a paradigm in the U.S. that leadership is, is innate within certain individuals. And, um, uh, and, and I just am not sure that's actually accurate when we start to dive into it. Uh, alternatively, in Europe, um, my views tend to be a little more aligned. And so, um, you know, the, they, in Europe, there's less of the notion of a heroic leader and more of, of a leader as a function, as a, as a role. And, and so there are different paradigms of leadership. And, and so I, I wrote it for me, and uh, that turned out to be pretty accurate because, as I said, I think there's only six copies that sold beyond you in the U.S. However, it's very popular in France. Very cool. Well, so, so tell me, what did you mean by leadership is a co-constructed story? So leadership is, you, you can't uh, identify someone as a leader 
unless there are people who also identify that person as a leader. In other words, if I stand up and I say, hey, folks, I, I'm a leader today. Well, it's great if I think I'm a leader, but if no one else follows me or considers me as a leader, then I, I'm just not going to be one. Um, you, you, can, you can be that guy with no clothes on, the emperor with no clothes on, but uh, you're not a leader if other people don't identify you as a leader. And then you have to think about leadership as, as people define your leadership based on what you've done or what they perceive you to have done. And that is a story that you can help influence through your own marketing, through your own um, branding, through your own telling of events. Ronald Reagan was, was both famous and notorious for that. Um, you can also, uh, Bill Clinton, by the way, was amazing at owning and taking over his story and, and getting other people to tell that same story. Alternatively, the journalists, historians, uh, the people who follow as acolytes, these same people also tell the story of you. The description today of Ronald Reagan would not be uh, recognizable of the real Ronald Reagan that's told today. The stories that conservatives uh, use to explain Ronald Reagan are not aligned with the Ronald Reagan of yesteryear when we start to look at, at, at even what Reagan talked about, him, of, about himself. And so you, you see the, this morphing of narratives, uh, both over time and the moment, who's telling the story and so forth. And so stories are co-constructed when it comes to leadership. And you, and you frame your book around these ideas of context, time, and perspective. Now, you just hit a little bit on, on those uh, uh, in what you just said, but can you expand on this? Uh, the yeah. So, so first of all, they're, they're, they're not completely separate silos. They're, they're, they interweave and have lots of crossover, and, and they're probably not scientifically um, uh, good factors, right? But context is the notion of all the different fabula, all the different elements of this uh, of leadership. So they're the people involved, the leader, the follower. Uh, it's the events, it's the times, the culture, the the props, all the factors that are present in the moment when a leadership event is happening. When someone is leading, here are all the the characters right? It's the movie. It's all the stuff that's in the movie, right? So it's the context. The perspectives are the people who are interpreting what happened and who are telling the story. So whether it's the leader herself, who, you know, uh, Margaret Thatcher going around telling her story, uh, Angela Merkel telling her story to people who may vote for her or who are writing the history books, or it's the journalists, the historians, the followers, the campaigners, or the biographers who are writing those stories. So the perspectives or are the interpretations of that leader and the leadership events, the context that happened. And then finally, this is probably very related and interwoven into perspective, but you have to look at how far away from a time perspective the interpretation is being developed. So, yeah, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, Andrew Jackson was a hero. For me, when I was a little kid, there, it was the Schlesinger biography about Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson was one of the top 10 presidents. He was a, a heroic in nature. Harry Truman talked about him as his favorite president. And now we, we've recognized that Andrew Jackson was a genocidal maniac. He, he was insane and he was a murderer and he was horribly, horribly um, uh, destructive and undermining of, of what many folks were trying to do in the United States. And so now you see him because of time having uh, passed and perspectives changing as a result of that, you're seeing him being reevaluated. Um, you, you see this with Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was a horrendous racist. And well, his international politics, we might find uh, things to, to be appreciative of, and there are many. Uh, when we look at his domestic policies and the way he treated uh, African-Americans, it, it, it's atrocious. 
and and he should be viewed through the lens of our times as much as we try and co-opt uh, empathy for the times of, uh, of, of his day. Um, but we need to, to overlay our value system. Uh, it's impossible not to. And when we do so, that time is going to affect our perspective. Yes, you mentioned uh, several or many presidents in, in the book, and you also talked about some other world leaders. So I think that was interesting that, uh, you know, we, we, we judge people, um, we expect them to be perfect. If they did something good, we expect that to carry through throughout their life. And, you know, we expect them to be somewhat less than human, I guess, or more than human. Um, but uh, mention some of the other uh, presidents and world leaders that, that you talked about in this book and, and give us a couple more examples. And we don't want to you know, cannibalize future sales of the book. It, it, it's okay because the book is so short. Um, it is short. The, it, the book is shorter than this interview. So, <laughs> so well, I. Well, with I, some of your favorite stories that uh, that you uh, related. Well, I, you know, it's. I'm actually very happy that Jimmy Carter is being reevaluated because Jimmy Carter did some great things. And, um, and I'm guilty of having uh, had contempt for Carter back when he was just recently out of office. And, and I remember my views of Carter uh, being slightly contemptuous and how he was diminished next to the FDRs and the Kennedys and the Eisenhowers and, and so forth. And now with perspective and, and time having passed, you can see that Carter did some pretty impressive things in his just four years in office. And one of them was he revolutionized the way we think of the vice president. And at, at, prior to, to Walter Bondale, um, uh, vice presidents were often just picked solely because of their political uh, value. In other words, is this person going to bring in enough votes for me to win? Or uh, will I get a certain region uh, that I wouldn't get otherwise. And, yeah. and then, you, you know, the, the vice presidency was viewed as, as a, a less value than a bucket of piss as, yes. oh my gosh, I'm going to blank on who said it. Warm. Uh, was no, it was, uh, it was uh, the guy who was vice president before Truman <laughs> with under Roosevelt. All right. uh, oh, well, we'll put it in the, the episode notes. Yes. But um but he was uh, the vice president didn't do much except sit around waiting for something horrible to happen to the president. And Carter made decided, I want a vice president who's qualified. And he actually spent a tremendous amount of time, came up with a plan for how he was going to identify and interview the vice president and did so. And then he put his office into the White House. And the, prior to that, the vice president wasn't even in the White House. And, and so Mondale was actually truly a part of the team. And this was, this was unheard of really until then. Um, if you think about it, Truman didn't even know there was a Manhattan Project when he took over. Right. Uh, Eisenhower had utter contempt for Nixon, just even, even when he became his son-in-law, just utter contempt for Nixon. Uh, not son-in-law, grandson-in-law. When, when uh, Nixon's daughter married Eisenhower's son, right? right? So just a, just a horrible, horrible way for that role. And a big part of it's because in the Constitution, there's no distinct responsibilities for the vice president. Uh, but with the exception of Dan Quayle, who was pretty marginalized for thankfully good reasons. Um, the spellings. <laughs> You, you find that every vice president after was leveraged. And even, even Mike Pence has been utilized in, in ways that you, you have to appreciate through Carter. Um, so that's one of them. Uh, the horrible president, John Tyler, who was our 11th president, I believe. He took over after William Henry Harrison died shortly uh, one month after being inaugurated. Um, and uh, Tyler was just an idiot, a horrible guy, horrible racist, who was, his policies were undermining of the financial systems in the U.S. He had bad tax policies, just bad. But 
no vice president had taken over. And Tyler said, you are not going to diminish me. I am the president. I'm not the acting president. I'm the president. And all subsequent uh, movement from vice president to president and role and function was defined by John Tyler. And that was a leadership moment. And these are things we should, we should acknowledge. But uh, my friend, Don Kirky, who, whom I think I met through you, I love Don. And Don has been attacking my views lately by saying, in a good way, I appreciate it, by saying that there's a big difference between leadership and business and political leadership. And uh, so Don and I have been having lots of conversations about that. And, um, and one of the things I think that's important about that distinction is due to this view I have of context. The context of business is very different than the context of politics. And so what is transferable, what isn't transferable? These are some of the new thoughts that I'm, I'm working through with the help of Don, because I think he raises a good point. Well, that leads me to uh, my second next question, because the first one here is, so bottom line, you know, why should current leaders and aspiring leaders take a good look at this book of yours? Well, I'm not sure they should. Oh, please. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think the value of it is, is to recognize that leadership is constructed. Yes. That leadership is not something where you are born or can be taught, that it's not predictable. You can't, I can't identify these six skills. And if I teach you these six skills, I can predict, therefore, you will be an effective leader because too much of context plays into that. And uh, I can't even maximize the likelihood you're going to be good. Uh, take John Quincy Adams. He was the seventh president of the United States. And John Quincy Adams is probably the best trained person to have been president ever. He was a secretary of state, ambassador to multiple countries. He was, uh, uh, he, he was trained brilliantly to be president. He's not a very good president. He was so high and hody that he, uh, he, he didn't do a very good job. And I recommend reading about him because he's, he's a great lesson of what not to do. Um, and so being trained to be a good leader, we have lots of cases. James Buchanan is literally the worst president we've had until, until the last four years. Uh, in fact, the Buchanan family threw a party when Trump was elected because uh, their ancestor would no longer be the worst president. <laughs> they knew it but way back in 2016. So, um, but Buchanan was incredibly well trained to be president. So then why was he so bad? Other presidents uh, were not so well trained. Um, Grant was a great military leader. And while Grant's um, value has gone way up in the last several years, uh, but he was not trained in politics. And his first four years were fantastic. And his second term, less so, but a lot of the scandals uh, um, uh, outweigh some of the benefits of his presidency. But a lot of the scandals have been overwrought as well. So there are lots of presidents uh, who are not well trained to be president. Uh, Barack Obama has been ranked 12th right out of the gate by historians as the 12th best president. This was a guy with no experience to be president. And yet, why did he do well? Is it because it's innate? Well, I'm not sure it's innate either. People who are innately great were not necessarily innately good in the presidency. Um, so we have lots of examples of people who are wonderful leaders in one context and not in others. Um, uh, by the way, Lincoln didn't have a lot of experience, right? So, so but, but your book, you, you, you wrap up the book with, uh, I think it's 14 points or whatever, and one of them is seize events as they occur, you know, turn them into opportunities. So one of the lessons that I think was a takeaway for me of the book was, you know, this whole notion of, you know, be ever vigilant, what, look for, you know, uh, opportunities. Uh, if it's a problem, you know, turn it into an opportunity. You know, failures can be spun into success, you say, and, and it's about the brand, it's about the messaging. Yep. Um, so there are things that, that I think that uh, 
uh, I think th th are reasons for people taking a good look at your book. But, but let me shift then into the uh, question that I was uh, suggesting that I had for you this, is that you once told me, I believe this is true, now you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that this was the first of several books, a series, mm -hmm. if you will. So is there another book coming from you in the near future? Has Don Kirky uh, burned you in a particular direction? What, what can you... Uh, so I've, I've, written a bunch of the of le I've written a bunch of stories, uh, little mini stories about uh, leaders. So Francois Mineral is, uh, was president of France. Um, and I find him fascinating because this is a guy who just completely dominated France for 40 years. And he, he would have these tremendous highs and then he would implode and, and fall to the earth and be horribly out of it for two or three years and find his way back. And the French never seemed to have a problem with the fact that this guy probably lied. Um, if you look up the Luxembourg uh, affair, you, uh, you will find um, um, a wonderful scandal to learn about. Um, where it's probable that, that Mineron set up uh, a potential assassination attempt on himself just to get the sympathy. Maybe, maybe not, but <laughs> the evidence is, is, is there. So um, how did the French forgive him for this? Well, a big part of it's because he, he, he branded himself. He told the stories about himself in a way that the French just were willing to accept. And, and he was able to go all the way up into the French presidency. Um, uh, I, I, the, the trick is that I, I have not found as many women in leadership roles who have the international acclaim that, uh, who aren't current, meaning like the Angela Merkels of the world. I would love to write about Angela Merkel, but I've been trying to write about people who are so far enough in the past that no one will yell at me about the political paradigm. Um, but there haven't been so many women of international acclaim. Um, there are a few like Indira Gandhi, <clears throat> Simone Weil in France. Uh, so there certainly are, are a few, but I, I'm sure that some of the people listening to this don't know who Simone Weil is, uh, where everyone knows who Winston Churchill is. And so, one of the things I've been writing about lately is why. Well, it's a story again. Who's writing the story of history? Who's writing the story of politics? It's not that we don't have women who, who influenced and led masses to greatness or to destruction. They, there certainly were. It's just no one wrote about it. And so I have found a whole bunch of stories about women who are amazing but who aren't as acclaimed as the Churchills, the Roosevelt's, the Gandhi's, uh, and should be. Uh, so are you going to turn these short yep. stories into the next book? Uh, that is the next one. Ah, cool. And that is the next one. expect this next book? Here? Well, uh, about two years ago. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's been a challenge with the, with the uh, shift in the world. Right now, we've had to make other priorities as we pivot businesses and things like that. Um, so it, it, it's on the docket. But it, and I, I have to admit, I, I got a little discouraged four years ago. Uh, as you can see, I'm passionate about presidential history. And, and frankly, the person who became our US president was a bit depressing and discouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of lost the passion for a little while, but it's back. So, so all of your passion, all of your readings, all of your writings, all of your learnings about leadership, um, what can you sum up uh, are your takeaways that uh, you'd like to convey to our audience about leadership? So number one, I don't believe leadership can predictably be taught. So we spend a lot of time teaching people. We spend, I think, $17 billion a year, approximately, according to ATD, on leadership. That's a tremendous amount of money, but what's our return? I'm not sure we're seeing the return. And Jeffrey Pfeffer, the Stanford business professor, has a wonderful book called Leadership BS. And he outlines exactly what the returns are on leadership development. 
and it's a really chilling first two chapters. Uh, so if we can't predict what is good leadership, then what are we teaching? Well, there are certain things we can teach. For example, we can teach people to analyze in, in their environment more. We can teach people how to forecast better. We can teach people how to predict. In other words, we can teach the proper business acumen for how to run an organization. And hopefully those are transferable enough. We can be more in the moment. So if we see an executive who is failing to connect with her people, we can then work with her on that in the moment and, and hopefully do some just-in-time development. But we don't need to spend billions of dollars training 20 or 30 people at a time through a curriculum. Curricula is just not going to work. Um, so avoid that. Secondly, I would avoid spending a lot of time calling things leadership. Uh, we're too nebulous with the definitions. We're, I, don't, I don't know what leadership is. And, uh, and frankly, in most organizations, who the hell cares? It probably doesn't matter. So I would focus people on what's going to get our business to be more profitable, more supportive of its employees, create greater place of well-being for uh, its staff and community. Um, these are the things we should focus on. And those are things we can teach. Those are things we can clearly teach and evaluate and measure. But why bother spending a ton of money on something nebulous and vague like leadership? What's your distinction between leaders and managers? Uh, this is my friend, our friend. You, you introduced me to him, Gary. I think you introduced me to everyone. <laughs> Gary DePaul uh, has written some wonderful books on the distinction between leading and managing. Um, but for me, management is the tactic. It's the execution. And leadership is the vague, nebulous, influencing process where one sells a story. Both are essential. One is a bit more abstract in, in the belly, and the other is more concrete and, and evaluative. We can evaluate good management. Uh, I can train people to be good managers because there's rote tasks that people do. Um, where So they're interwoven, they're interconnected, there, there's certainly a, a, a fine delineation, but they are distinct. Yeah, mentioning Gary, uh, his new book on, uh, or his new podcast series on mm -hmm. unfold leadership, it struck me when I was reviewing your book last, last night, you had labeled leadership in there, and uh, I immediately made the connection between the, the two uh, yeah. perspectives. Yeah, we, Gary and I have a different perspective, but but not really. I think in many ways our perspective is is semantic. I mean, our differences are semantic. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure our differences are actually huge in values or philosophy. Yeah, I don't think so either. Uh, yeah. My read on both. Matt, thanks so much for doing this interview with me today. Over oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Maybe we'll get an eighth sale in the U.S. <laughs> We'll work on that. All right. Thanks again and uh, have a great day. Thank you.